and yet you somehow have to do that. And how are we going to do this? We're going to do this by sticking to one overriding principle of message-based programming. Now, you might say that it already is message-based, right? You send messages all the time to the object. Uh, but there are people who make the difference. Uh, so don't take my word for it. Uh, apparently, there are people who should know uh, that don't think that uh, Smalldog is really a message-based programming language. So what is a message-based programming language? Uh, I actually haven't checked with Alan this is what he thinks, but I believe this is essentially the same interpretation. Every operation you do at runtime should be a message state, without exception. So why is Smalldog not a message-based language? Well, let's take a look at a fragment of Smalltalk code. And all the stuff here is red. At least this projector gets the color is right. Excellent. Uh, not everyone <laughs> does. All the things that are in red are not message sent. So there's an assignment. There's a global or perhaps a class variable. We happen to know it's a global, but you know, general there are class variables as well. This thing, we don't really know what it is. It might be an instance variable, might be a temporary, might be a parameter. Uh, let's assume it's one of those. And this guy is an instance variable. Most of this stuff is not a message sent. Now, if you try to program so that everything is a message sent, if you do that, you're going to have to define a whole bunch of accessors, and the code will look something like that, uh, which is not so nice. There's basically a lot of stuff already in red, so they can do something that you should really rather get rid of. Now, we're not the first to try and do everything with message sense. Uh, Self did that long before us, and they came up with this idea of have, making the receiver explicit so that things would not be so verbose. And if you write it that way, things get a little shorter and it will go like this. And the only slightly annoying thing are these parentheses. Um, so, just to show you, we tweak the syntax a little bit differently than Self. And I'm showing you this not because it's terribly interesting, but because it'll, it might be helpful in looking at the examples later. Uh, so we produce this double colon notation. Uh, T double colon is very much like T colon. It's a message sent, uh, but uh, it's priority is lower. So that you don't have to parenthesize like this part. And it will return you uh, its argument, regardless of what uh, the actual so it basically calls the colon, but syntactically at a lower priority, and when people with the uh, army computer. So that, that looks pretty good if you compare it uh, back to that. And uh, so, so we made these adjustments to the syntax, and, and you hopefully can keep that in mind when we get to the real examples. Now, looking at, uh, at our small talk fragment, so what is all this bias? Why is it important to use just message sense? Uh, if we take a look here at the case of instance variables, well, what we get out of this is a property that already existed itself, which is uh, I call it representation independence. Right? You can change which how you lay out your objects, you can, uh, how which selection of things you decide to make instance variables, and how many doesn't affect any code you write. Right? In Smalltalk, it doesn't affect your clients, but it affects your class and subclasses. Here, as itself, essentially, it doesn't affect any code. But as long as you maintain that public protocol, whether you, know, you can replace an instance variable with a, with a method that computes it or vice versa, and no one is the wiser. So that's a nice property to have, but in itself, it's sort of hard to justify uh, you know, changing the language just for that. But it turns out that this has much more far-reaching uh, effects, as we'll see. So let's look at uh, another issue, these globals or class variables, right? These, again, are, are being replaced by access methods. So what that means is there are no class variables, no global variables, no pool variables of any sort, no class instance variables either, because we don't want to have any static state in this language whatsoever. And uh, why is that a good thing? Well, it's a good thing for tons and tons of reasons that I won't really get into a lot of. Detail, it's good for distribution because there's one less special case one has to worry about. It's good for re-entrancy. You write tests, you'll find it's very good. In certain contexts, it can be good for startup. It probably doesn't matter that much in the small talk context, but say in the Java context, it matters a great deal. Uh, memory management, again, there's one less special.
special case that the people who build the VM have to worry about. And uh, in particular, what I wanted to mention is that it's good for security. And you remember security was one of our goals. So um, there's this uh, great fit between object-oriented programming and the idea of capability. <coughs> Right, capabilities are these kind of keys that you can use for security as opposed to checking, right? If you have a party and you invite people and you don't want gate crashers, you can do two things. You can basically have someone at the door who checks if whoever is coming in is on the list, or you can have someone at the door check whether and insist that they hand in invitations, they have a ticket, they have some sort of token. Capabilities are, are, are the latter solution. Basically, you have a capability to do something in some way which is very much not the standard mainstream solution. The mainstream solution works so well for security, that's why we don't have any security problems with computers anymore. Uh, so uh, this is not a new idea. Uh, Mark Miller has been pushing this rather uh, strongly in the past few years and wrote a really nice PhD thesis about it. Uh, and uh, you know, basically, I've believed in the fit between objects and capabilities for a long time. But Mark has done a lot of the real work to argue for it and, and, and do case studies and, and design a language called E to test these ideas. Uh, so basically, in order to do anything in the real world to influence something, anything that could have an impact on the world, and therefore could have a negative impact on the world, <coughs> it be done maliciously and therefore needs to be controlled by security, any such thing, you have to have an object that serves as a key as a, to give you that authority. Uh, but what's critical here is that you don't have static state. Because say in a language like Smalltalk, of course anything you do you have an object, right? But that doesn't really guarantee you anything because uh, you have act everybody has access to all kinds of objects that can do bad things, right? For example, you, everyone has access to an object called Smalltalk, which implicitly you can reach via and, and uh, name your variables and so forth. And in that are things like file, which will let you go and, and tamper with the file system. Or things like class that will let you basically find all the instances of class and therefore tamper with any code in the system. So these are kind of things that you can't just have anybody just grab out of the air and access. These capabilities, their flow has to be controlled. They have to be given explicitly where they belong, where people really need them, and not by default. And uh, the security people call this idea no ambient authority, right? There's, there isn't uh, authority to do stuff just in the air. Um, another thing that, that uh, is important to, to add in this context of security is access control. Uh, so in small talk, all methods are public. And on the other hand, uh, essentially all instance variables are protected. And the problem is we've just gone made and made everything a message sent. So now, if we don't change anything else, everything's public, right? We just expose everything. There's no control. So if, if we lift it that, we're sort of in the same state as the hash table languages. You know, Perl, Python, da 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 right? The people who think that objects are hash tables and not the other way around. And so we, we don't want that because the only way in those languages to get any kind of encapsulation is explicitly through closures, through blocks, whatever you call them, lambdas, right? And that's programming at the level of lambda calculus. It can be done, everything can be expressed, and it's a royal pain. And so we actually want to have meaningful access control on methods. Uh, and so we've introduced notions, uh, we're not trying to innovate too much in that space, uh, public, protected, private messages, uh, but they don't work like the ones in Java, of course, they're per object uh, rather than per class. And this is enforced dynamically and based on the context-free syntax, so the enforcement costs you essentially nothing. But I probably won't have time to talk about that in, in any detail today. But if you're interested, ask me later. Uh, so another security issue, as, as I said <coughs> earlier in small talk, is uh, it's very hard to argue that this, a system is secure when anybody, who you give someone an object, and they can change its, its internal state by doing like its far at foot. Or uh, getting the object's class and then changing how that object behaves. And for extra benefit. You know, extra credit, they get to change how all the other objects of that class behave, whether they were being handed a pointer to them or not. So small talk was not really designed around the notion of security, shall we say. Now, what, what uh, the E people did, uh, they threw out the 
maybe with the bath water, right? There's no reflection in the secure language. But uh, we don't want to lose that because that's really where, where the action is. That's, that's the real power. Uh, fortunately, self addressed that uh, as well. It didn't really address it as a security issue, but, but the solution works for security as well. There's this notion of mirrors. Mirrors are objects that reflect other objects. And so rather than getting being able to reflect on any object in the system simply by asking it for its class, etc., etc., uh, you need to, to uh, ask for a mirror. A mirror is something you get separately. You need some factory, some, some resource that will give you mirrors for other objects. So there's no direct connection from an object to its reflection. And if you're handed that those kinds of mirrors, you can do reflection. And if you're not, you won't be able to do reflection, and you can be as, as stupid as four threshold. And it's important to have that measure of control. It's good for security, it's good for a lot of other things. Uh, Dave Munger and I wrote a paper <coughs> in 2004 about this. Uh, it doesn't speak much about security, really, but it speaks a lot about distribution, deployment, etc. There's all kinds of, of advantages to this approach. Basically, it's the object-oriented way to do reflection. So this is, part, this is our security story, which is still in progress. Uh, now, going back to this question of static state, right, this is not a common approach, right, you know, this isn't a functional language, and even in a functional language, really, <coughs> the minute you want something actually done, you find that it, it, it's hiding there, it's hiding, it's made very complicated, it's hiding in a monad, but the fact is, it's there, and, and it, it still has the same four issues. So, and where, this is an imperative language, uh, by default. And uh, so the question is, where does the state go? Well, obviously it goes in objects, but that really begs the question because the whole point of static state is state that multiple objects need to access. And you want to be able to access that conveniently, like right? you know, one start passing everything through plumbing, etc. So how do you get these things to share state conveniently without having static state? Fortunately, the Scandinavians figured this out, you know. Also, 30 years ago. Most things were figured out 30 years ago. Uh, very little progress has been made since. Uh, so, essentially, uh, you put the, the, the shared state in a shared lexical scope uh, by means of nested classes. And if you've done Java and think of nested classes, please erase, erase the problem from your memory. We're not talking about that. We're talking about nested classes as in beta. There are the people who invented nested classes. Uh, they were an inspiration for the Java nested classes, but in general they, they sort of didn't work out uh, the way they were intended. Um, so the beta approach was motivated by modeling. It's very good for modeling. It, it, it really gives you a natural way to think about the world and how it's hierarchically organized and to organize your programs to mirror that. Uh, it's also a natural modularity solution, classes within classes. And modularity was one of our key goals. And so uh, at this point, it's, it will be better to actually show you a bit how this looks rather than talk about it. So this is, is a running piece uh, of image. You speak run at the moment on top of sweep. So it's actually sweep. Um, but um, it looks a little different. Larger would be welcome. Larger would be welcome. How do I do that? Uh, oh, yeah, I know it's hard to run all over, but. Uh, Good, that's great. Okay. Yeah, well, now it'll, it'll tend to, as we move along, it'll we'll get all confused, but we'll, we'll live with that. So, uh, 
guys here, they're all in classes nested within the class common control parts. So there's a small talk version of this library, and then they just sit in a category. And this is a fairly simple example because there's just the two levels. But uh, when you do more interesting things, you, you get multiple level, levels of nesting. But now we've got them all bundled together as uh, in, in, in one unit, which we can instantiate as an object. So let's have a look at what's going on here. Uh, inside one of the classes that's important here is combinatorial parser. It's a class nested inside. It's the root of the hierarchy for this whole parser library. All, almost all the classes inherit from it. And again, we're not going to go into any detail about what it does. I just wanted to show it to you. And because other classes we'll be referring to. So an example of a class that refers to it is this guy, alternating parser. So alternating parser <coughs> is a nested class, and it's a subclass of combinatorial parser. And here we're showing actually a fragment of the real syntax. Uh, for, the, for the class. One, one of the differences between you speak and, and small dog is there is a syntax. Uh, and I'm sure there are people here who have religious views about that. But uh, this isn't about just uh, having, you know, getting away from file out format. Which is an important issue, right? It's a very it's very helpful when you try to explain this stuff to other people. So, well, can you save this for me? Yeah, here. See all these bags? It's human readable. It's fine, don't worry about it. And it'll confuse the hell out of your source control system that is full of stateful information, like when it was filed out. It'll be different every day you file it out. And so, you know, it's one of those things that you should not be proud of as small brothers. If you are proud, then you can do it for too long. Uh, in any case, there is a syntax, and it isn't about particular files or just the ability to exchange. It's about an intentional representation of the program. In any case, uh, what the syntax shows us, uh, this thing has a bunch of slots, what you call instance variables, right? They're listed just like temporary targets in virtual bar, right? And uh, each of these slots will automatically um, induce a pair of access or methods, enters and setters. So there'll be things like, for example, uh, pfund and pfund colon. So pfund will give you the value of the slot, pfund colon will let you set the value of the slot. And what I really wanted to show is this method, just to go and give you a feeling for, for how, how it actually works with, uh, with the uh, systematic use of uh, message sense. So here's the method. It doesn't really matter what it does. It has two parameters, PF1 and PF2. And they're used here and here. And now you should be saying, wait a minute, didn't you say we only had message sense, right? We don't have variables. And indeed, we do not have variables. When you declare a method like this, the formal parameters will induce accessor methods that are accessor methods on the context. So when you run this, at least in principle and practice, it compiles to the same thing. Okay, but uh, when you run this, conceptually what you're doing is you're calling, a, when you say PF1 inside this method, you're calling a getter method on the context to get the value of that parameter. And there is no setter method, which is why you can't change the parameter, right? This isn't a static error that you get when you, you type it into the browser and says, oh, you're not allowed to assign the parameters. There is no assignment. There are no variables. It's a message sent, and there won't be one, at least on the context, that will let you set, set the one. Yeah, you have a question. In practice, no. So in practice, we can compile it to the same old thing. Uh, you, I've had thoughts about this. There may, there may be interesting applications, but at the moment, no. You can't override it. <coughs> uh, so those are the parameters, and, and the locals will be similar, except the locals will have set of things. You have the temporary value. <coughs> then you've got here, PFUN. This is the double colon notation. PFUN and PFUN, we're calling the setters that were automatically defined to these guys. So that's, that's okay. Uh, the real reason I'm showing you this is this guy, because this is where it gets interesting. See? Now this is terrible code, and it's going on, it's literally gone away, but I still show it. Because uh, how terrible is the use of this kind of, right? Which you should never really do, and we tend to, to change that. Uh, but what's interesting is 
small context, right? So this is not a global variable. Right? Where does it come from? Well, it comes from up there. There's a slot apparently called block context, and it will have an axis or method, so that's what we're calling. But what is this about, right? Obviously, this module does not define its own block context, really. It doesn't. It doesn't. That's something that you should be getting from, from standard library. So, um, <coughs> let's... Here again, in this view, we're showing the syntax again for the class, for the outer class, the com uh, combinatorial class. And as you can see again, the vertical bars and a list of, of slots in between, it's at this time the slots have initializers. These are slot declarations, these are not expressions. And what these initializers are telling you is that this, these slots are defined when the object is created, they shall be initialized by these expressions here. So now we know that the slot block context is being <coughs> initialized by an expression that something called platform is being sent to message block context and it's supposed to return something and that'll be the initial value of the slot. And because it's an equal sign, it's a read-only slot, which means that you can't change it later if there's only a getter method again. When it is initialized, there will be a magical setter method that the compiler can access that will actually set it. But beyond that, you will not be able to tamper with it. So, so you have a choice of so find Very often you find a surprising number of, of slots are actually never changed after they're, they're initially set. So it's quite handy to do this. Now, of course, we beg the question of where platform comes from, right? So the point that I'm, I want to make here is that a class, a top-level class in UCP, a class that isn't nested in another class, doesn't see any surrounding scope. There is no global scope. It would actually be okay to have a global scope as long as nothing in that scope was stateful, because we still wouldn't have any static state. But in fact, we found out we didn't really seem to have a need for any kind of global scope. So there is no global namespace as such. And these top level classes don't see anything except what they themselves have defined or inherited. <coughs> and as a result, you don't have any way to refer to any standard library or anything unless someone gave it to you, right? Platform is in fact defined here. It's a formal parameter. See this message pattern? So the idea here is that you declare as part of the class syntax, you, de you can declare a message pattern that is going to be used as the, ma the main factory method. So when the actual class object comes for combinatorial parsing, will support a message using <coughs> and when you call that, that will cause an instance to be created and these initializers to be run. And the initializer will be run in a context that will have a platform accessor corresponding to the name of the formal parameter. And that formal parameter, the value we'll get from it includes, of course, the actual parameter that got sent. So that's what, so platform is a name defined here, but it, it's nothing, it's something that will have to be passed in. Now one of the results of that is, see these guys? These are all the external dependencies this module has. These are the only things in the environment that it cares about. It can't see anything else, everything has to come through here and they're listed here very explicitly. So you actually know what you're using from the environment. Which is a contrast from small talk, maybe you like chasing. Uh, so that's one property that, that these things are organized to, to help make things more modular. Yeah? Is it necessary to have these uh, assignments in the initializer, or can you just refer to platform block context anywhere in the new code? No, you, you have to. The platform is in scope in this section, but not in here. It's actually it's, it's, it's in the context of that initializer. What's so you would have to do that. Yeah, that would be really bad style. You can, of course, no one can help you if you want to write crappy code, but you could assign platform to a slot named platform, and then you'd be just, uh, you'd be just uh, in the same situation as you are, say, in Java with uh, uh, whatever they're called, uh, full modified names, right? It is a bad, bad thing, and we're, we're starting, uh, fortunately, we have a small number of users that we can pretty much hand train. And if anyone picks this up, they better do this, because otherwise their code will be garbage. And um, 
So you don't, it doesn't really force you to, but it's a, it's a very easy style guideline to follow. Uh, if you follow it, then A, you don't have to use a longer formulation when you refer to it, and B, you actually know exactly what you're depending on. Now, here's the question to this. Oh, okay. I'm going to do the cues. Are you saying that uh, uh, he also has two qualified names? There's no such thing as false, no. Yeah. no. It's a message sent, right? But you, you, could, you could have a sign, have a slot name platform, a sign platform, and everywhere in here you say platform block context, platform error, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really bad idea. So, yeah. Um, so you always have to know uh, beforehand which class you want to call. Beforehand? Yeah, I mean, if you define the class, you have to know which class you want to call. Or is there like a tool? Well, okay, so, so what, 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 two things. There should be better tooling supports, right? As you type in your code and you decide, oh, I actually needed to get a set. Well, you'll find that set isn't defined. In fact, the browser will tend to highlight that. And, um, and then, currently, you'll have to go up and, and add that slot, right? What you really want is that, as it, Mark tells you this is undefined, to give you a toolkit, some sort of option to say, put this in automatically. And so if you actually try coding with this thing, you very find that there's a, following this discipline, every time you introduce a new dependency, you will realize it and make it explicit. Uh-huh. Uh, constants like uh, strings and numbers, are they also message sense? Uh, so this is uh, a point of, of uh, still debating this. Basically, string itself is a message sense. Now, a few of these guys are conveniently inherited from objects. Like, object itself is a message sent that you inherit from object. Uh, string, array, a few of these things, because, because they're used for li literals in the language. Now, what the definition of a literal is, is something that if you read the new speak spec, you'll see that there's commentary saying, well, we could do it this way or that way. At the moment, we're sort of cheating and doing it the standard way. But it is very tempting to actually define that to be the result of sending a message, say, string new, you know, it, it's a little tricky, but you can do that. that. That gives you a lot of options. But in any case, you can, uh, uh, you can override string or object with another message if you want to. But the literals, the question is whether the literals are defined with respect to these messages. And that kind of gives you cool options, because then you can actually make literals that behave differently. Now, whether you think that's a good idea or not, depends on how much you've been drinking. Yeah. Um, but, but there are, for domain-specific languages, are really neat applications. But requires really disciplined use, otherwise you'll make a mess of things. Okay, we're never going to finish this stop, but go ahead. Uh, are the slot assignments message sent? Yeah. And the slot assignment, okay, so, so this is not a, uh, an expression, right? But they actually are compiled into message sent. Because it's very important, actually, as a practical engineering matter, that all the code that's doing message sent, nothing but the actual thing that assigns the slot to the end. Somewhere there's a there's code that physically assigns storage, but there's only one such method, the actual thing. It makes, makes your ID, everything gets simpler that way. Now, where was I? Um, so, these making external dependencies was one, one point that, that helps things be, be organized in a more modular way. But it's important to, to understand that when we actually instantiate this class, so top level classes like this are called module definitions. When we instantiate it, we call the objects resulting from that modules. When we instantiate such a module, the only connection that object has to the outside world is through this, these parameters. Right? In this case, there's one, there could be more, depending on how you which uh, message pattern you put there. The default, by the way, if you put nothing, is just mute. So the only way an object can actually do anything to the world is by accessing parameters that were explicitly given to it, which is a nice fit with the capability-based philosophy I was outlining earlier. Like, uh, essentially, every module has its own sandbox. Like, every instance is living in a sandbox defined by the parameters you chose to give it. The other point is, of course, the not parsing or any other such module definition is still a class, and you can, of course, make multiple instances with different parameters, and they can all coexist. So you have what is known in, say, things like OSGIS, side-by-side deployments. If you follow that world, you can't believe what a big deal it is and what a monstrosity of, of complex structure has been built in in an attempt to support it, right? But they're just objects. You instantiate them, you can configure them differently. 
differently. Uh, they will give you have different collection libraries with different algorithmic properties, etc. Uh, of course, you can also uh, define uh, this guy. And all of these guys, another point is that these guys won't interfere with each other. If you have multiple instances, because each one has its own slots, there's no static state where they're going to step on each other. So the code is inherently, module code is inherently re entered. Yeah? So you're using lip stack as part of the language, you can have freely choose that. You can freely choose that. Right? If you write nothing, the default is new. And uh, yeah, you can choose that, give as many parameters, any, any uh, that's better. But, but it is magic in the sense that you just give the name and it arranges for, for something to actually a class method and then an instance method is involved with Okay, so what else can we do? Yeah. And can you add new classes on the fly? For example, if you compile an HTML page which becomes a server on the fly and it becomes a new class, can you add that? Uh, sure. You, you, what, what you need, of course, is the right mirror, right? You, you need the capability. If this is running on Squeak. It's small. You can do all the kind of reflective things, any change you can do in small talk. If you have the right object, you can do it. What's different is there's a discipline about how you use that. So you can actually track who uses what and restrict it. Not everybody should be doing that. Uh, let's see, what other points do we want to make about this stuff? Uh, of course, one of the nice advantages of having all these classes now within one object is that now we have a protocol for the entire library that we're observing. So now we can have different implementations of this library that observe the same pro protocol. For example, this is a parser combinator framework. You can implement it as a backrack parser, which is uh, an approach where, where you basically use up a lot of memory, but you make it go very fast, all kinds of algorithms. You can have different implementations and an application using this parser, like, like, the, uh, like the new speak parser. It doesn't care. It's using a library that obeys this protocol, but that's just an object. And so you, you can plug into different implementations of a library transparently, right? The whole library is obey a protocol just like a single object. You can have multiple implementations, which is a nice thing. Question. How are your applications this model? You're thinking of whether we'd have like a registry or something? Uh, yeah, I'm not keen on that solution. Uh, we'll get to that. <coughs> I, hopefully I will, I will have made this clear by, by the time I enter on 11 o'clock or something. Um, and if not, then, then. <laughs> So, another detail we want to look at. Uh, one of the things that's worth uh, mentioning, of course, is all these classes, right? Is there any of the so how are we referring to these classes? Of course, we're referring to them as message sets, but via message sets as well. When you define a nested class, essentially a, a, me, a, a method that will is an accessor for it is, is defined automatically. And what that accessor does, well, <coughs> that's not very easy to get there. We'll explain what the accessor does. But essentially, every reference to a class is, of course, also a message set, which means, for example, that they can be overwritten in subclasses. Right? So you can override classes just like you override methods. And therefore, you can uh, do inheritance at the level of entire libraries. And I'll show an example of that in a moment. Uh, the other thing, I guess, that's worth noticing, I should have told this. Uh, right? So what this implies, of course, is right here. When I say I'm going to a parser here, that's not the name of a class really either, right? There's no way to refer to a class. So it's, it's a message set. Right? So it's dynamically bound. When I compile this thing, I don't really know who the superclass is going to be. So all these classes are essentially mix-ins. Right? And all of this is not because I like mix-ins and, and you know, spend a, a lot of time on them, but because it just falls out. It has to be this way. If you take this principle of using messages seriously, a lot of things just fall out. Everything is an object is a nice principle, but it actually just falls out because it, all you can do is send messages, and obviously the only thing you can talk to is our objects. 
classes are first class because, well, they, you, you are only going to access them via messages and they're going to have to be returned. Right? All kinds of things that you would, are, are good ideas that you're used to in small dog and other people who are slowly but surely coming around to are, are just art, you know, they, they are inevitable. You can't do it wrong. You stick to this principle and everything will just fall out. So everything's a mix-in and we can override these guys. So let's try and find a class of override. It so happens by coincidence that I have one here. Uh, so block must combinatorial parsing is a class that's a, that is a subclass of uh, <coughs> And it has a bunch of nested classes, but much less. Right? In particular, it has uh, alternating parser, which is the one we were looking at before. But it's overriding that. It's also overriding combinatorial parser. It's also overriding this guy. Uh, and, it, and it has three new classes for its own dark purposes. So what does it do? When, what's happening when we override, say, combinatorial? So, combinatorial parser turns out to be a sub, is now in this uh, module, is, is over in to be a sub <coughs> super combinatorial parser, which is a slot defined up here, which is literally defined to be super combinatorial parser. So we're actually, the module is sending, it's a super call to the module super class. And so we're going to get the original combinatorial parser class and use it as a super class of the one that we want to use in our class. So we get an extension. And then we do whatever we want to it. We add a slot, we, we add a couple methods. Um, do what you want to do. Yeah. What kind of message send is super? Super is a message then that where the lookup starts from a different point. And here it actually is dynamically bound, unlike small. Because you never know the super classes. <laughs>
one that John Marks of here in the context of, of, of this module is a subclass of the one inherited from the super home. Now the nice thing about this is now that I've overwritten combinatorial parser, all the subclasses of combinatorial parser defined in this library, including the ones that I haven't changed here, the ones inherited, are going to get the new one, right? Just as when you override a method, the sort of recursive self-reference guarantees that you're going to get the, the latest method. So if we go and, and look at, say, an example of that,
And inside we'll write a bunch of code that hooks up these modules, right? That instantiates the module definitions by passing them to the platform or whatever they need, and maybe the person references between them and builds our application based on the linkage code. And then we serialize that object. And what our runtime needs to do when we deploy things is to deserialize this object and call main with whatever object it thinks represents the platform at that point in time. And it can decide how much platform to give you. It can decide that, you know, this is a trusted application or not. And therefore, I will give you mirrors or I won't give you mirrors. I'll give you mirrors that are like Java that only let you introspect, that don't let you change anything. Or mirrors that only let, let you look at your objects but not others. Or, you know, all kinds of variations, right? And uh, so that, that's actually, not all of this is quite done yet, but that's our deployment uh, strategy. Uh, we're also going to let you build executables and DLLs and all this very easily because uh, yeah, interoperability is, is one of our things. So here's another issue. Um, I hate to tell you this, but uh, there are things about small dogs that are rather pretty. And uh, you all know what this stuff means, but again, like file out format, it's one of those things that you should be most proud of. Right? You, you, you've taken your, your friend of Python or C programmer and given them this lecture about how everything's an object and everything's a message set, blah, 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 and they stumble upon this. And you explain to them, oh, yeah, this is sort of a message set too. Um, you know, but we have to make this less primitive. <laughs> uh, so, um, right. You know, it's, it's, it's something for it isn't actually clear who the receiver is, right? It's both. So, uh, we don't have a primitive syntax in you speak. Uh, we don't have a primitive construct. What is a primitive? A primitive is something that was inconvenient to do in the language. It's either hard to express or just slow or whatever. And you want the VM to do it for you. So you send the VM a message. You reify the VM through a mirror, an object that represents it. And you can send, you know, whatever needs to be a primitive is just a message sent to that object. Now the nice thing about this is that now you have control who sees the primitives and what primitives. Because the VM mirror is another capability that you can withhold. You can either make it available to a module or not. And therefore, you know, you, can, you don't have to worry if some, this primitive does something that not everybody should use. Again, the same mechanism for control applies to it. Uh, why am I talking about this in the context of interoperability? Well, I just wanted to mention it, but really primitives are very closely related to foreign function calls. Right? In most languages, you, in a typical situation, like in Java, you do your VM in C. You have a mechanism for calling C. Then you say, well, how am I going to get the VM to do something for me? Well, I'll just, it already is C code. We'll expose you know, a C call and we'll call that. It's very tempting, but it confuses two different notions. Because you know, the VM primitives don't have to do all the stuff that a C call has to do. They don't have to marshal stuff and worry about data conversions and all that stuff. They know more about your data than you do, the VM. Uh, the other thing, the assumption that, of course, your VM is written in C or whatever foreign language is bogus too, because if you do things right, eventually your VM will not be written in the So, uh, and, and you know, all the problems of primitives in small talk, in small talk it's reversed, right? Primitives were their first for historical reasons. Uh, but all the ugliness and, and lack of portability and the fact that it's an afterthought are still there in all these different, you know, versions of primitives that service foreign function calls and those calls. So we use a notion called aliens. <laughs> Alien objects are they're foreign objects. Uh, if you're familiar with US immigration, you're also familiar with the usage of the term alien there. Um, and uh, basically, you know, you, you uh, a DLL, for example, would be an alien object. Right. What's a DLL? It's an object with a bunch of, of, <coughs> of messages you can send it to do the different functions that the DLL supports. Uh, and if you wanted to call back, you send it up to a, a block and you know you can talk to it at a reasonable level. The nice thing about this is you can have as many, you know, as many alien libraries as you need. Right? If you need to talk to Objective C, it's not quite the same as talking to C. If you need to talk to Java, it's different again. And you can have different libraries. You don't need to have a language feature called extern C or extern Fortran or whatever garbage that is out there. Uh, and uh, again, the same access control mechanisms apply, right? If someone is allowed to call C and therefore can pretty much do what they want if they're really determined to, you trust them to do that, you give them the access to the C aliens. If not, you don't. Or 
maybe you know what, what calls they need. You only give them access to the alien that will do the particular C calls they need, not random C calls. So all this kind of fits together. Uh, one of the things we've done with that is, is, uh, is our GUI. So the, the browsers you saw earlier, this is the same browser basically you saw earlier. Let's, uh, let's prove that. Um, uh, less. So this is the home screen. Uh, a slightly newer version of it. But uh, basically, this, this whole browser works sort of a lot like a web browser. Except in an ID, it turns out to work even better. Uh, you see me use this history mechanism. Well, that's just the history of where I've been. But in an IDE, you develop a working section. So you're never more than two clicks away from anywhere you've been. And all these things remember where they were and in what state they were and things like that. Uh, let's see, this one might have been in state, right? This guy, so this is still open, right? Exactly the way we left it. So, right? So this is actually the same thing, except it's in Vista. Vista is still slightly flaky. It, it works perfectly in XP and Vista. Apparently, we don't have a Vista machine, really. Uh, this I managed to run because eventually a, a free Vista license fell into my hands. Uh, and paid for this stuff. But, uh, so, so we found there are some glitches. They're probably because we're not calling the XP API exactly right to be compatible or something. But basically, it, it all works native. And we should have native bindings for other stuff for Linux and, and Mac. Uh, you know, the hard work we're getting to run on Windows once it works on Windows. And so that, that's part of the goal is to have a system where you can build, interoperate with the world, build real client applications that look like real client applications that are delivered like normal client applications, but you don't have to use it as garbage, right? Uh, and why are we doing this? Well, we don't have time to tell you why we're doing this. Uh, and so, you know, we'll trip all that. And uh, well, you know, we'll where we are. So this is all work in progress. Uh, Kind of with three, we've been at one point we were four people, maybe we'll be four people again. They promised me five when I started, but you know, promises are promises. Uh, but it's kind of a little difficult to build a fresh platform with that many people, uh, so, so we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we are open sourcing it, uh, and probably actually make an official public release in early 2009. Still won't, won't be complete, of course. Uh, at the moment, we've actually handed it out to, to select uh, colleagues to, to collaborate with to, to people to check it out and tell us what's, what's obviously broken. Um, and uh, mainly, we're, we're lacking libraries from the library work because we're still using it. This thing is embedded in Squeak, for better or worse. We get to call all the Squeak stuff and we get to live with all the Squeak stuff. So. That's, that's the problem. So the collection libraries, you actually, what platform really is, platform is, a, is basically a thing that does, does not understand and looks up in small talk, right? So that's that's how we, we, we call these modules in practice. Uh, and we don't have a real platform. So obviously there are, uh, there's room for improvement. Uh, there's constantly things we're, we want to do, but uh, we do have uh, a pretty nice IDE. Uh, the GUI is portable. Have, uh, yeah, most of the things I've described are actually. So the VM underneath is squeak. At the moment, the VM underneath is squeak. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be. Uh, in particular, it would be interesting to also have a, a binding to um, a GUI binding to say uh, HTML and a compiler to the JavaScript. And see how to do that. It's a little tricky to to do the reflective stuff, but uh, and might be too slow at the moment, but that'll get fixed in time by other people. And so, uh, yeah, we're not particularly married to Sweep. Sweep is a great place to, to start because it's very flexible, very easy. We've had to change white codes to, for some of these things to make them you know, better. The access control will require further white code changes, but that's really easy in Sweep. Uh, so, yeah, but uh, this whole thing, that's a Sweep image, basically, that you ran. It won't run on a vanilla Sweep VM anymore. But basically, that's it. Uh, so yeah, we haven't done the currency yet, a whole bunch of other things we need to do. Uh, but what's important is, as a design, this is all of a piece. All these concepts really fit together well. The message-based programming basically dictates everything. It gives you this component-style modularity with the virtual classes, the mix-ins, etc. It fits very well with the object capability model. The mirrors fit with that. It'll also fit nicely with 
of actors. And eventually we, I even want to return to, to my hobby <coughs> of night systems, but I've spent far too much time on that in my career already, so it's sort of the bottom of the list. And I'll just leave you with the people who have done some work on this. And uh, if there are any more questions, yeah? What about versioning, so that you can say, not only do I need something screen, but I need something screen in version 3.8, because in version 3.9, there is the message that I send that has slightly different semantics, and it depends on the old semantics. Okay, so, so uh, Abruptum and Sane Asylum, I don't know Amsterdam that well, but there must be a way to get there. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, versioning, a versioning is a raffle. <laughs> So at some point, um, I, I can't really show you right now because I don't have a connection to our, to our server, but uh, right now we, we do, for example, source control through a, a nice GUI that eventually talks to SPN. There's some Monticello involved at the moment, which is something we're desperately trying to get rid of. It was a temporary measure in the working state we made on the project, um, but we will eventually talk to standard source control and let you basically get any see any, this is a different answer to a different question, right? <laughs> This is 
you speak code that happens to be, use a library defined in such a way that you can write code that looks almost like BNF, except it runs. And you can subclass it to give it semantic actions, and that's again another talk. And this is the stuff we actually use, or actually we actually most of the time use a small talk version of this because this new compiler is ready yet. Yeah, we have to start somewhere, but we are. We are I'm the only project that I'm aware of that actually uses a parser combinator library for its in you know, for its language <coughs> in practice. Uh, as opposed to you know writing papers about it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we do that. And and so it's very easy to do these languages, but it isn't that simple. <coughs> yeah. Uh, frequently uh, in the super discussion you said um, you actually never know what the super class actually well, you don't know for sure. You usually actually yeah. have a pretty good idea of what you expect. Yeah, pretty good. Is there some support for the developer about uh, how does the almighty element F word have so lots to do with maintenance? So effectively, I have to know what a superclass is in certain situations, and I need to know. So is the uh, will the debugger or something else will support me? Or? Well, obviously, when you're debugging it, the class has a superclass, right? Classes, classes always have superclasses, a particular class, which is in it, right? Your code definition doesn't tell you statically what superclass is. Just as your small talk code definition doesn't tell you statically what a method call is actually going to call, right? And if you're a foreground programmer, you'll probably tell me that you need to know what subroutine you're calling. No, you don't. It's exactly like everything else. It's a message sent. The last thing you need to know is to freeze it down so it'll never change and you can never fix it. You do not need to know, you need to not know, so that you can reason about it and not in the abstract about its properties and its protocol. And then when you're debugging, yeah, specifically, that object has a class with a specific superclass, and a specific call site at a specific time calls a specific method, right? But the code doesn't specify that. It's not over-specified. How do I know which messages I can send to a receiver if I don't know what the superclass is? How do you know that in small talk? Well, I, can, right? I can I can oh. see what messages are implemented by my superclass. You don't know what class this object is until mm -hmm. a runtime. What do you mean? What you need is, of course, a type system, <laughs> right? That's when you know things. You can nail them down in their coffin so nothing ever lives and nothing ever moves. There's no difference here. There's absolutely no difference. You have exactly the same strengths and weaknesses as you have with any other dynamic binding of message sets. Now, in practice. Most of the time, you have a pretty good idea of who you're going to use it with, right? For example, in a module, when you mention a superclass that is another class in that module, that's likely to be a superclass until you override it somewhere, right? But you could override it, so you can't be absolutely sure that someone won't take this and, and so forth. But there's nothing new here. There's nothing that you don't do every day with methods. It's just applied uniformly. Yeah? So, yeah, I think that's Okay, is that enough? Apparently not. <laughs> 
Um, from, well, from my background, but I'm biased. I guess one of the specific needs of that project is kind of security, <coughs> modular security, in such a way that you're going to load more code or runtime. Right? <coughs> so these, uh, what do you call it, Mo modules are serialized, but the methods are compiled, or you always transfer them on source mode? At the moment, they're compiled, and, and one of the weaknesses is they're compiled into bytecodes that are, in fact, sweet both kinds of bytecodes, and there's nothing secure about running on a sweet VM. Right. Um, yeah, that was my question. Uh, so, actually, security as such was not, is not very high on the list. It's just something that has not, for this particular project, a lot of other things. If you want to deploy stuff on the internet, <coughs>